This is a picture of a child from Romania. Research demonstrated that children who lived in state-run orphanages had shorter telomeres than children living in foster homes. And this seems to be related to early childhood stress. The reason for the concern is that the telomere is basically the tip of the chromosome. And as the telomeres shorten, information in the DNA begins to vanish. As information in the DNA begins to vanish, um, we end up causing cell structure and function to break down. And the result is that cells and tissues die, and that shortens the lifespan. Okay, and they were able to determine this by looking at the DNA extracted from children in orphanages versus cohorts that weren't. And they found that um, when correcting for age and sex, um, that it was this early childhood stress that seemed to be correlated with the decrease in the length of the telomeres. Like the small plastic tips that keep the ends of the shoelace from unraveling, telomeres prevent the chromosomes from being degraded at their ends. And in spite of the protection provided by telomeres, chromosomes of most cells progressively shorten every time there's a cell division. The reason for this is that the telomerase, which is the enzyme that maintains the telomeres, can't always keep up with the rate of cell division. Okay. And it seems as if the expression of the telomerase is related to stress levels. Okay, um, exception occur, exceptions occur in germ-like cells that produce future generations in certain stem cells, and unfortunately, a lot of cancer cells have escaped normal constraints of cell division, i.e., they maintain their telomeres. Okay, it was in 2011 that they observed this phenomenon of the shortening. Okay, um, so how stress affects the telomeres and results in their shortening, we don't have a definitive mechanism for, but we certainly are able to correlate the shortening of the DNA with the shortening of lifespan because we've been able to observe that in organisms with extremely long lifespans, the length of the chromosomes uh, is is more or less maintained, whereas in organisms that don't, the length of the chromosomes is shortened significantly. And we've also managed to overexpress the enzyme that maintains the telomeres in cells that normally die in tissue culture. And what we found is that as long as we provide oxygen and nutrients for them, they don't die. They become what are called telomerase immortalized cell lines. Okay? And they're molecular techniques that allow us to do this. The packaging of large amounts of genetic information into a tiny space in the cell has a, basically presented a storage problem in evolution. Um, if we look at E. coli, a single molecule of DNA is 4.6 million base pairs, and if stretched out straight, it would be about a thousand times as long as the cell that you find it in. Human cells have over 6 billion base pairs of DNA, which would measure over 2 meters, which is 6 feet for you and I, if it were stretched end to end. Even the DNA in the smallest human chromosomes would stretch 14,000 times the length of the cell nucleus, so DNA molecules have to be packed into this tinier space. The structure of DNA can be considered at three hierarchical levels. The primary structure of DNA is its nucleotide sequence. The secondary structure is the double-strandedness and the tertiary structure is higher order folding that lets the DNA be packed into smaller spaces. Some terms we need to become familiar with are negative supercoiling, which is the tertiary structure formed when strain is placed on a DNA helix by overwinding it, positive supercoiling, where um, the tertiary structure uh, occurs opposite negative supercoiling when strain is placed on the DNA helix um, by overwinding, whereas um, the negative supercoiling is by underwinding. Okay, the relaxed state of DNA, which is its energy state, uh, that's the molecule 
but that has no structural strain on it. And the supercoiling, which is the super with tertiary structure that forms when the strain is placed on the DNA by overwinding or underwinding. Okay, so the idea here is that we look at a piece of circular DNA as an example. Okay, the DNA could be in what we call a relaxed state, meaning it just forms a ring. Okay, it could be positively or negatively supercoiled, meaning that it's either over or underwound. Okay. Um, and in that state, it has stored in it potential energy, okay, which can be released when enzymes reverse the process, okay. So this is just a form of, of transferring energy um, from what does the over and the underwinding, which is basically ATP-fueled changes in the DNA tertiary structure, okay, uh, versus the release of that energy when we relieve that change in the tertiary structure. Okay? So this supercoiling takes place when the DNA helix is subjected to strain by being over or underwound. B DNA is in its lowest energy state when it has approximately 10 base pairs per turn of the helix and in this relaxed state a stretch of 100 base pairs of DNA would be about 10 complete turns. If the energy is used to add or remove any turns, the strain is placed on the molecule, causing the helix to supercoil or twist on itself. Molecules that are over-rotated exhibit positive supercoiling, where under-rotated molecules have negative supercoiling. Supercoiling is a partial solution to the DNA packing problem because supercoiled DNA occupies less space. Supercoiling takes place when the strain of over-rotating or under-rotating can't be compensated by the turning of the ends of the double helix, which is the case if DNA is circular. If the ends can turn freely, they'll simply turn as extra rotations are added or removed, and the molecule will spontaneously revert to its relaxed state. Both bacterial and eukaryotic DNA usually fold into loops that are stabilized by proteins, which prevent free rotation in their ends and the supercoiling takes place within these loops. Okay? So for instance, the human chromosomes are linear, right? Bacterial chromosomes and extra chromosomal material um, are circular. And so in a bacterial chromosome, the supercoiling takes place like you see in this particular figure. In the eukaryotic chromosome, it's going to be confined to constricted loops of double helix. Supercoiling relies on topoisomerases, which are enzymes that add or remove rotations from DNA by breaking nucleotide strands, rotating the ends around each other, and rejoining them. As a result, these enzymes can induce and relieve supercoiling, but not all topoisomerases do both. So these are enzymes that add or remove rotations in the DNA helix by temporarily breaking and then resealing nucleotide strands. And the energy to do this comes from ATP. Okay. That's what drives it. When a bacterial cell is viewed with an electron microscope, its DNA frequently appears as a distinct clump, which is called a nucleoid, and this is confined to a definite region of the cytoplasm. If a bacterial cell is broken open gently, its DNA spills out in a series of twisted loops, as shown here. The ends of the loops are most likely held in place by proteins. A lot of bacteria have additional DNA in the form of small circular molecules called plasmids, which can reproduce independently of the chromosome because they contain special sequences that are called origins of replication. Okay? Um, some plasmids have what are called relaxed origins of replication and some have what are called stringent origins of replication. Those with relaxed origins of replication um, can make many copies of themselves inside the bacterial cell and those with restricteds uh, have the ability to make fewer copies. Okay? So the nucleoid is just the bacterial DNA confined to a definite region within the cytoplasm. Eukaryotic DNA in the cell is closely associated with protein, and this complex of DNA and protein is known as chromatin. And the two basic types of chromatin are euchromatin, which undergoes normal process of condensation and decondensation during the cell cycle, and heterochromatin, which remains highly condensed all throughout the cell cycle, even in interphase. Euchromatin is the majority of chromosomal material, and when um, we examine it, this is where most of the transcription takes place because it has a more open conformation. 
All chromosomes have some heterochromatic regions where transcription basically doesn't occur. Uh, the Y chromosome also contains um, large amounts of heterochromatin, which can occur during developmental stages. This material is referred to as facultative heterochromatin. As an example, this type of heterochromatin occurs along one entire X chromosome in female mammals when X inactivation takes place. In addition to remaining condensed throughout the cell cycle, heterochromatin has lack of transcription, the absence of crossing over, and the replication happens late in S phase. Differences between euchromatin and heterochromatin uh, are in Table 11.1, which we'll see in just a second. Okay, so what makes a euchromatic and a heterochromatic region? Well, basically, there's there's sequences that indicate the enzymes um, which areas of DNA um, need to be converted into heterochromatin. They recognize that, and they can chemically modify the heterochromatin so it stays that way. All right, there are covalent modifications that can take place, whereas the euchromatin um, has to remain relatively open so that it can be unwound and transcribed. You can't transcribe DNA unless you unwind the double helix. Okay, So let's take a look at the levels of chromatin structure. The DNA in an average human chromosome is about 10,000 times longer than the diameter of the nucleus itself. How do 46 such DNAs compact into a cell nucleus and still function properly? Chromatin has a highly complex structure with several levels of organization. Double-stranded B-form DNA, only 2 nanometers across, is at the primary level. At repeated intervals, nuclear DNA molecules wrap almost twice around octameric protein cores that are assembled from four dimers made up of different pairs of four different very abundant histones. The resulting histone DNA complexes are called nucleosomes. The nucleosomes are clamped tighter by a fifth type of histone that binds where the DNA joins and leaves the histone cores. These complexes, the chromatosomes, repeat along the DNA about every 200 base pairs, creating a beads-on-a-string image when examined with an electron microscope. Chromatosome beads are separated by DNA linkers averaging about 45 base pairs. Histone interactions contribute to folding of nucleosomes into a somewhat irregular, densely compacted 30 nanometer fiber. The 30 nanometer fiber folds into a series of loops of varying length that average about 300 nanometers and are tethered on one end to a protonaceous nuclear scaffold. The tethered loops condense further to generate another irregular fiber about 250 nanometers across. This is the condition of most interphase DNA. During mitosis, this fiber spirals into larger coils, about 700 nanometers across, that form the large, dense chromatin structures called mitotic chromosomes. So what you're looking at here is just a comparison of euchromatin and heterochromatin. Okay. Um, purpose of heterochromatin might be to maintain spacing between regions of euchromatin for the purposes of gene expression, okay, uh, a buffer against crossing over uh, in regions where we don't want crossing over to happen. There's lots of theories out there about why there is heterochromatin. One of the things that we know about heterochromatin is that frequently the genes that are no longer utilized, that are evolutionary artifacts, can be found in certain heterochromatic regions, okay? So they got deactivated over time because the, the working version of the gene is the one that we want to use, okay? Chromatin has a very complex structure with several levels of organization. The simplest level is the double helical structure of DNA that we talked about in Chapter 10, and at a more complex level, the DNA molecule is closely associated with proteins and is highly folded and makes a chromosome.
The nucleosome is the basic repeating unit of chromatin consisting of a core of eight histone proteins, two each of subunits H2A, H2B, H3, and H4, and about 146 base pairs of DNA that wrap around the core about two times. The linker is the small synthetic DNA fragments that can be manufactured um, containing restriction sites and these can be attached to the ends of any piece of DNA and used to insert into a plasmid vector and this is one of the ways that we clone things okay so sometimes what we can do is we can take DNA and we can we can break it apart okay and take those fragments and then we can add these linkers to the ends and clone them into a plasmid and then we can examine what we've cloned into the plasmid by sequencing it using primers that are complementary to these linker sequences as well as sequences in the plasmid. And so this is one of the ways that we determined um, where, where the DNA was that was between the histones and what its sequence was and if there were any consensus sequences and uh, the DNA that was around around the histones, okay, and looked at um, the sequence composition in those regions as well, okay, and that told us that um, we had um, at least uh, some aspect of um, DNA sequence regarding the association of these histones with the DNA, okay. When chromatin is isolated from the nucleus of a cell and viewed with an electron microscope, it frequently looks like beads on a string, and if a tiny amount of nuclease is added to the structure, uh, the enzyme can cleave the string between the beads and leave individual beads attached to about 200 base pairs of DNA. If more nuclease is added, the enzyme chews up all the DNA between the beads and leaves a core protein attached to small fragments of DNA. And these experiments demonstrate that chromatin is not a random association of proteins and DNA, but has a repeating structure. Okay? The core of protein and DNA produced by digestion with the nuclease enzymes is the simplest level of chromatin structure known as the nucleosome. The nucleosome is the core particle consisting of DNA wrapped about two times around an octamer of eight histone proteins, much like the thread that's wound around a spool. The DNA in direct contact with the histone octamer is between about 145 and 147 base pairs long. Okay. So again, we can examine the length of these fragments and we can also sequence them by cloning them out. Right? We'll talk about um, changes in chromatin structure that we can observe, right? Polyteen chromosomes, um, chromosomal puffs, DNA sensitivity, which correlates with um, areas of high transcription or areas of euchromatin, and then epigenetic change through co covalent modification, such as methylation. Okay? Giant chromosomes, which are, which are called polytenes, are found in certain tissues, such as the salivary glands of Drosophila. Okay? Uh, they've, um, these insects have provided researchers with evidence of the changing nature of chromatin. These large, unusual chromosomes come when repeated rounds of DNA replication take place without cell division, and that makes thousands of copies of DNA lying side by side. When polyteen chromosomes are stained with dye, bands re reveal themselves, and under certain conditions, the bands exhibit puffs, which are localized swellings of the chromosome. Each puff is a region of the chromatin that has a relaxed structure and, as a result, a more open state. Research indicates that chromosome puffs are regions of active transcription. This correlation between the occurrence of transcription and the relaxation of chromatin at a puff uh, site indicates that the chromatin structure undergoes dynamic change associated with gene activity. It's a long way of saying basically um, when when you see these little regions that are bulged out that's telling you the DNA is getting unwound more and the reason it's getting unwound more is because we want more transcription to take place and transcription can only happen if the DNA is in a more open state. Okay? DNA sensitivity basically uh, indicates the, the euchromatic state, right? A second piece of evidence that indicates that chromatin structure changes with gene activity is the sensitivity to DNAs1, which is an enzyme that digests DNA. 
The ability of this enzyme to digest DNA depends on the chromatin structure. When the DNA is tightly bound to histone, it's less sensitive to DNAs, whereas unbound DNA is more sensitive. The results of experiments that determine the effect of DNAs on specific globin genes, globin is a protein that's involved in the production of an oxygen-carrying molecule. Examples include myoglobin in muscle, hemoglobin in blood. Okay. Um, this was done in chick DNA, and it showed that DNA sensitivity is correlated with gene activity. Globin genes uh, encode several types of hemoglobin expressed in erythroblasts of chickens at different stages of development. These types of experiments demonstrate that transcriptionally active genes are sensitive to DNAs1 and indicates that chromatin structure is more exposed during transcription. So you, you can basically think of the ability of this enzyme to chew up the DNA as a way to indicate um, where the DNA is being used most to make message. The nature of the change in the chromatin that produces um, the puffs and the DNA sensitivity um, has to do with its, its over and its underwinding, right? In both cases, the chromatin relaxes. Presumably, the histones loosen their grip on DNA. One process that alters chromatin structure is acetylation. Enzymes called acetyltransferases attach acetyl groups to lysine amino acids in the histones, and this reduces the positive charges that normally exist on lysine and destabilizes the nucleosome, so the histones hold the DNA less tightly. Other chemical modifications of the histone proteins like methylation and phosphorylation can change their structure, as do special chromatin remodeling proteins that are going to bind to the DNA, okay, and affect its its um, secondary structure, okay? Well, let's say it's tertiary structure. We've seen how certain chromatin structure can be altered by chemical modification to histone proteins. A number of other changes that affect chromatin structure include DNA methylation, the use of variant histone proteins in the nucleosome, and the binding of non-histone proteins to DNA and chromatin. Although these changes don't alter DNA sequence, they often have major effects on gene expression, and we'll talk more about that later. Okay? Some changes in chromatin structure are retained throughout cell division so that they're passed to future generations of cells and even occasionally to future organisms. Stable changes in chromatin structure can be passed on to descendant cells or individuals, um, and we can see this, you know, by by performing experiments that check for the degree of methylation. Um, we call these epigenetic changes, or epigen epigenetics. As an example, the agouti locus helps determine coat color in mice, parents that have identical DNA sequence but have different degrees of methylation on the DNA, give rise to offspring with different coat colors. This epigenetic change has been observed in a lot of organisms responsible for a variety of phenotypes. Unlike mutations, epigenetic changes don't alter DNA sequence and are capable of being reversed and often are influenced by environment. Okay, so um, an example of a basis for an epigenetic change. Okay, you might have a particular DNA sequence and in the mother, all right, there will be methylases that recognize that sequence, add the methyl groups, and shut down transcription from that region. Okay, even though the DNA sequence hasn't been changed, although the DNA bases have been modified, all right? Whereas you could have that same sequence in the father, and because he lacks the methylase activity, the methylation pattern won't take place, and the result is going to be that that region will be expressed, okay? So depending on what methylase you've got, okay, and what sequences you have, it's like almost a second genetic code, okay? Mom kind of um, puts a blanket with holes in it over the information. That would be her methylase activity. And it's the areas that have the openings where the sequence is not methylated that you can still use for transcription if it's euchromatic, okay? Whereas those that are methylated are not going to be used. And that's one of the reasons that um, the female usually has more influence over gene expression than the male does. And that's one of the reasons you sometimes see um, loci that have epigenetic uh, context to it expressed differently when the, the father carries it versus when the mother carries it. Okay.
centromere structure is a constricted region of the chromosome, and that's where the spindle fibers attach, and we learned about that when we discussed cell division. Well, telomere structure are the ends of chromosomes, and it provides a means to reproduce the ends of linear chromosomes. So we'll talk about those. We'll talk about the centromere, which is a constriction re constricted region of the chromosome. This is where the kinetic core and the spindle, app, spindle microtubules hook up. The chromosome structure is necessary for a proper chromosome movement in mitosis and meiosis, because if you're missing it, you, you don't segregate properly. The essential role of the centromere in chromosome movement was recognized by early geneticists who observed that the consequences of chromosome breakage means that the DNA was usually lost. When one chromosome break produces two fragments, one with a centromere and one without, the one without is going to not attach to the spindle apparatus and slowly vanish. Okay. Um, what are the key features of the centromere? In Drosophila, Arabidopsis, which is a plant, and in humans, um, the centromeres span hundreds of thousands of base pairs. Most of the centromere is heterochromatic. Surprisingly, there are no specific sequences that are found in all centromeres, which raises the question of exactly what determines where it is. Research suggests that most centromeres are not defined by DNA sequence, but epigenetic changes in chromatin structure. Nucleosomes in the centromeres of most eukaryotes have a variant histone protein called SenH3, which takes the place of the usual H3 histone. The SenH3 variant is required for the assembly of proteins associated with kinetochore. The presence of the SenH3 histone probably alters the nucleosome and the chromatin structure and allows the kinetochore proteins to bind and the spindle microtubules to attach. Okay, so this isn't something that's completely fleshed out yet. Telomeres are the natural ends of chromosomes. Pioneering work um, by McClintock and Muller showed that chromosome breaks produce unstable ends that have a tendency to stick together and enable the chromosome to be broken down. Because attachment and degradation don't happen um, to the ends of chromosomes that have telomeres, the telomeres serve as caps that stabilize the chromosome and protect DNA sequence. Telomeres also provide a means of reproducing the ends of a chromosome. And as we'll see a little bit later, okay, um, we discovered down the road uh, the structure of telomeres and how they are replicated. Okay, there's an enzyme called telomerase that does this. Telomeres have now been isolated from protozoans, plants, humans, and other organisms, and most have a similar structure. The telomere sequence is going to be repeated units of adenine and thymine nucleotides followed by several guanines, taking the form 5' prime, then an A or a T, um, and then a methylated guanine, um, which is going to be a certain number of guanines in a row, okay, um, and then 3' prime N. You can see some of those sequences uh, in the table here, okay. Um, the M is going to range from 1 to 4, and N is going to be from 2 or more, okay? So A or T, sub M, um, you could have four repeats of that, okay? And then G sub N, um, you might have two or three repeats of that in a row. Uh, as an example, the repeating unit in humans in their telomeres is 5 prime, double T, A, triple G, 3 prime which can be repeated um, from hundreds to thousands of times. The sequence is always oriented with a string of G's and C's towards the end of the chromosome, as shown in the table. So a telomeric sequence is that found in the ends of the chromosome consists of many copies of short, simple sequences repeated one after the other. So uh, that basically serves as a, a guide pin for the telomerase to find that part of the chromosome and finish the job of, of producing the DNA double helix in a linear chromosome. Okay. The G-rich strand in DNA at the ends of chromosomes produce, uh, often protrudes beyond the complementary C-rich strand at the end, and that produces an overhang, okay? a G-rich 3' overhang. This overhang in telomeres in mammals is from 50 to 500 nucleotides long, and proteins bind to this G-rich single-stranded sequence and protect the telomere from breakdown and prevent the ends of the chromosomes from sticking together. 
a multi-protein complex called shelterin binds to telomeres and protects the ends of the DNA from being inadvertently repaired as a double-stranded break. In some cells, the G-rich 3' overhang can fold over and pair with a short stretch of DNA to form what's called a T-loop, which can help in protecting the end of the telomere and break now. So the shelterin is just the multi-protein complex that binds this overhang and keeps it from being torn up. Okay, The length of the overhang is a property of the action of the telomerase, which finishes off the reproduction of the linear DNA. Eukaryotic organisms are going to vary in the amount of DNA per cell as a quantity um, termed an organism's C value. Okay? Each cell of a fruit fly, for example, contains 35 times the amount of DNA found in the bacteria E. coli. In general, eukaryotic cells contain more DNA than prokaryotes do, but the variation among eukaryotes in their C values is large. Human cells contain more than 10 times the amount of DNA found in the Drosophila, where some salamander cells contain 20 times as much DNA as a human. Clearly, the differences in C value can't be explained simply by differences in the complexity of the organism. So what is all the extra DNA doing? Okay, This is called the C value paradox, and we don't have a complete answer to this. Analysis of eukaryotic DNA sequences has revealed a complexity that's absent in prokaryotic DNA. So something's going on in there. Um, the C value defined again is the haploid amount of DNA found in the cell of an organism. The C value paradox, the absence of a relation between the C values of the eukaryote and how complex it is. Okay. So there's a lot of DNA in there, in there we don't know what it's doing. Okay. The first clue that eukaryotic DNA contains several types of sequences not present in prokaryotic DNA came from studies in which double-stranded DNA was separated and then allowed to reassociate. It's called annealing. Okay? When double-stranded DNA in solution is heated, the hydrogen bonds that hold the double helix together melt. And with enough heat, the two strands separate completely. And this is denaturation. The temperature at which the DNA denatures, which is called the melting temperature, or T sub M, depends on the base sequence. Okay? CG-rich DNA, which forms um, three hydrogen bonds per... Um, uh, complementary base pair, okay, uh, is going to be diff more difficult to melt than AT rich, okay. So the difference in melting temperature is going to be a result of the difference in the amount of uh, CG in the DNA itself, okay. It takes more heat to break apart those CG rich regions, okay. And so that tells you something about the overall sequence. So this is kind of a way to guess it, uh, the composition of the DNA before we had the ability to sequence from end to end the whole genome. The denaturation of DNA by heating is reversible. If single-stranded DNA is slowly cooled, single strands will collide and hydrogen bonds will form again between the complementary base pairs. This is called reannealing, and that produces double-stranded DNA. So the renaturation is just the reverse process. This is easier to do when the complexity of the DNA is less. Okay, and It's more difficult to do when the complexity of the DNA is higher. Two single-stranded molecules of DNA from different sources, like different organisms, will anneal if they're complementary. This process is hybridization. For hybridization to happen, the two strands from different sources don't have to be perfectly complementary, just enough that the bases can hold the two strands together. The extent of the hybridization between DNA from two species can be used to measure the similarity of their sequences and assess their evolutionary relationship. The rate at which hybridization takes place provides information about the sequence complexity of the DNA. Okay, So that's hybridization. So this is kind of a primitive way of asking the question, how much alike is DNA from X versus DNA from Y? Okay. So the more similar they are, um, the more easily they're going to hybridize, um, and the more similar in sequence they're going to be. Okay. So we're just looking here at the genome sizes of a few different organisms. This is the C-value paradox. A bacteriophage, remember, is just a, the equivalent to a virus for a eukaryotic cell. It's a non-living pathogen that can attach to and hijack a bacterial cell and turn it into a phage factory. Okay? E. coli is a bacteria, right? And then you can see some of the other eukaryotes that are in there as well. 
eukaryotic DNA consists of at least three classes of sequence. Unique sequence DNA, moderately repetitive, and highly repetitive DNA. Unique sequence DNA is sequences that are present only once or at most a few times in the genome. This DNA includes sequences that encode protein, as well as a lot of DNA whose function we don't know yet. Genes that are present in single copy are about 25 to 50 percent of the protein encoding genes in most multicellular eukaryotes, of which humans are one. Other genes within unique sequence DNA are present in several similar but not identical copies and are collectively referred to as a gene family. Most gene families arose through duplication of an existing gene and include just a few member genes, but some, such as those that encode immunoglobulin proteins and vertebrates, have hundreds of members. The genes that encode the beta globins are another example of a gene family. In humans, there are six beta globin genes clustered on chromosome 11. The polypeptides encoded by these genes join alpha globin polypeptides and make the hemoglobin in red blood cells, erythrocytes, right? So a gene family is just a, um, a multi-gene uh, assembly within an organism. Unique sequence DNA is just a DNA that's present only one or a few times in a genome. Other sequences, which are called repetitive DNA, exist in multiple copies. Some eukaryotes have large amounts of repetitive DNA. As an example, half the human genome consists of repetitive DNA. A major class of repetitive DNA is called moderately repetitive, which consists of sequences of 150 to 300 base pairs long. These are repeated thousands of times. Some of these sequences perform important functions for the cell. As an example, multiple copies of the genes for ribosomal RNA, rRNA, and transfer RNA, tRNA, made up, uh, make up moderately repetitive DNA. However, the function of much moderately repetitive DNA is unknown, and it may not have a function. Although, again, we won't know that probably until way down the road. So moderately repetitive DNA it consists of sequences between 150 to 300 BP, which are repeated thousands of times. Repetitive DNA, DNA sequences that exist in multiple copies in a genome. Okay, So one is just a subset of the other. Moderately repetitive DNA can be split into two types of repeats. Tandem repeats appear one after another and tend to be clustered on a particular location in the chromosome. Interspersed repeats are scattered all over the genome. An example of an interspersed repeat is the ALU sequence, which is a 300 BP sequence that's present more than a million times and constitutes 11% of the human genome, although it has no obvious cellular function. Again, no, to say no function is kind of going out on a limb. No function that we found. Okay. Short repeats, such as the ALU sequences, are called SIGNS, which is an acronym for short interspersed elements. Longer interspersed elements consisting of several thousand base pairs are called lines or long interspersed elements. One class of lines called line 1 is 17% of the human genome. Most interspersed repeats are remnants of transposable elements, sequences that can multiply and move. Okay, So lines are long DNA sequences repeated thousands of times spaced all over the genome. Signs are short DNA sequences repeated many times and interspersed all over the genome. And interspersed repeats are repeated sequences that are found at multiple locations throughout the genome, while tandem repeats are moderately repetitive DNA in which sequences are repeated one after the other and tend to be clustered in specific regions on a chromosome. And it was these areas of the chromosome that presented an early obstacle in the Human Genome Project. Right? How do you get through these long areas of repeats and create overlapping contigs in order to generate the entire sequence? And eventually we were able to conquer that through a variety of cloning strategies. Other major classes of repetitive DNA are highly repetitive. These short sequences, often less than 10 base pairs long, are present in hundreds of thousands to millions of copies and are repeated in tandem and clustered in certain regions on the chromosome especially centromeres and telomeres. Highly repetitive DNA is sometimes called satellite DNA because its proportions 
of the four bases differ from those of other DNA sequences, and as a result, it separates as a satellite fraction when we centrifuge it in a density gradient, like a cesium chloride gradient. So basically what you do there is you, you, you generate DNA prep from a cell lysate, and then you put it in a, in a cesium chloride solution and seal it inside an ultra centrifuge tube. Okay, um, it's it's that it's it's a basically a polycarbonate tube that's sealed at both ends. You put it in a in a vertical rotor, right? So you drop it in a in a rotor in a in an ultra centrifuge where the samples um, are are gonna gonna go be straight up and down. Okay, um, swinging bucket is a is a is a different deal. Okay, swinging bucket is where the the um, the sample would flip out on a on a flexible arm during the spin, okay, and that's not what we're doing here. It's a vertical rotor, and what will happen is that um, that you centrifuge it overnight. Uh, you centrifuge it under a vacuum, okay, because you're going um, at very high speeds of rotation, okay, more so than you would get in a centrifuge where there was air in the chamber, and what will happen is that the different densities of DNA will settle at the density of the cesium that's um, in the solution because the cesium will also separate according to its density. Okay, And then what you'll be able to do is visualize that DNA because you usually put something like a thidium bromide in there which binds to the DNA and fluoresces when you hit it with UV glows orange. And then you can pull those bands off with a syringe and then uh, purify it and then ask questions about its sequence composition, okay? And so that's part of how they do this, right? As we've seen, eukaryotic chromosomes reside within the nucleus and have a complex structure made of DNA associated with histones. However, some DNA found in eukaryotic cells occurs outside the nucleus and has a different organization and exhibits different patterns of inheritance than nuclear DNA. This DNA occurs in mitochondria and chloroplasts, which are membrane-bound organelles located in the cytoplasm of eukaryotes. Mitochondria are present in almost all eukaryotic cells, whereas chloroplasts are found in plants, algae, and some protists. Both organelles generate ATP, which is the universal energy carrier of cells. Mitochondria are tubular structures that are from about a half to one micrometer long in diameter, and the size of a typical bacteria, and there's a reason, reason for that, okay? Whereas the chloroplasts typically are, are from four to six micrometers in diameter. Both are surrounded by two membranes enclosing the, re enclosing the region. This is called matrix in mitochondria and stroma and chloroplast. And the matrix has enzymes, ribosomes, RNA, and DNA. In mitochondria, the inner membrane is highly folded in structures called Christi, okay? And there are enzymes embedded in here that are responsible for the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. You guys learned about that in, in bio or if you've taken A&P, okay? And that's where we crank out most of the ATP in the organism um, through the production of a proton gradient in the intermembrane space. Okay? And if you need to review that, um, ask me and I can point you to where you can get a summary of that. Chloroplasts have a thylakoid membrane, highly folded, and the aggregates are called grana, and this membrane bears pigments and enzymes required for photophosphorylation. New mitochondria and chloroplasts come from division of the existing organelles. These divisions take place throughout the cell cycle independent of mitosis and meiosis. So this is evidence of endosymbiosis, right? The theory goes that the mitochondria and the chloroplasts were basically uh, descendants of early photosynthetic and non-photosynthetic bacteria that took up residence inside eukaryotic cells and carried out those functions for them. And they both got something out of the deal. Okay? And we know that, or we think we, we're pretty confident of that because the, the DNA resident in chloroplasts and mitochondria has a similar sequence to bacterial DNA. The ribosomes, which do the translating in chloroplasts and mitochondria, are basically like bacterial ribosomes. Um, so they're different from the ribosomes that are out in the cytoplasm of the cell itself, although functionally the same, the parts are different, okay? And then the inner membrane of the uh, mitochondria is um, 
a lot more like a bacterial membrane um, than the outer membrane is. So the theory is that the inner membrane came from the endosymbiont early on, and the outer membrane came from its entry into the bacteria. Okay, so a little evolutionary history. Um, mitochondria chloroplasts have DNA that encode polypeptides used by the organelles, as well as ribosomal RNA found in the ribosomes and tRNAs needed for translation of those proteins. And again, the sequences are more like bacterial than they are eukaryotic. The genes for most of the 900 or so structural proteins and enzymes in mitochondria are actually encoded by nuclear DNA. The mitochondrial genome typically encodes only a few proteins and a few ribosomal RNA and tRNA molecules that are needed for mitochondrial protein synthesis. So over time, what's happened is that by taking up residence inside the host, they've offloaded some of the genetic material responsibility to the host, and the genetic material in the organelle is just there for those basic functions. Okay. So chloroplasts and mitochondria are similar to bacteria. The resemblance isn't superficial. In fact, there's compelling evidence that the organelles evolved from bacteria. Okay. Um, DNA sequence, right? Similarity of the uh, tRNAs, the ribosomal RNAs, and the ribosomes themselves. Okay. So this is the idea, right? Endosymbiotic theory proposes that mitochondria and chloroplasts were once free living, became internal inhabitants or endosymbionts of early eukaryotes. It's assumed that over time, many of the endosymbionts' original genes were lost, okay, or were transferred to the nucleus of the host. So this is the theory pictured here, right, endosymbiotic theory, okay. Um, this is the theory stating that some membrane-bound organelles like mitochondria and chloroplasts originated as free-living eubacteria, okay, and entered an endosymbiotic relationship with the host and as a result became um, it basically dependent on the host to live, okay. Uh, in the case of the mitochondria, um, the eukaryotic cell gets the, uh, the energy production and uh, the, the uh, endosymbiont, the mitochondria, gets a home and a constant supply of energy, right? For the chloroplast, um, the um, eukaryotic cell gets the sugar production, okay? And the chloroplast gets protection from inside the eukaryotic cell. A lot of evidence supports the idea that mitochondria and chloroplasts originated as bacteria. A lot of modern single-celled eukaryotes are host to endosymbionts. Mitochondria and chloroplasts have similar uh, size to present-day bacteria and have their own DNA, which shares characteristics with bacterial. Mitochondria and chloroplasts have ribosomes, some of which are similar in size and structure to the bacterial ribosomes. In addition, antibiotics that inhibit protein synthesis in bacteria but don't affect protein synthesis in eukaryotes, can damage protein synthesis in chloroplast and in mitochondria. The strongest evidence for endosymbiosis comes from DNA sequencing that demonstrated that the sequences of the mitochondrial and the chloroplast DNA are closely related to sequences of genes of modern-day bacteria. Okay, so that's our that's the idea, right? Kind of cool. Mitochondria and chloroplasts are present in the cytoplasm and usually inherited from a single parent, usually the mother. Okay. As a result, traits encoded by mitochondrial and chloroplast DNA exhibit uniparental inheritance. In animals, mitochondrial DNA is inherited exclusively from the female, although occasional male transmission of mitochondrial can happen. Maternal inheritance of animal mitochondrial DNA may be a function of the size of the gamete. Sperm are tinier than eggs and have fewer mitochondria. But recent research has found that in some eukaryotes, paternal mitochondria are selectively eliminated by autophagy, where the mitochondria are broken down by the cell. In these cases, paternal mitochondria are targeted for destruction, while maternal are not. The mechanism that produces the difference is not yet known. Paternal inheritance of organelles is common in gymnosperms, like pine trees, okay? and in a few angiosperms, which are flowering plants. Some plants even exhibit biparental inheritance of mitochondrial and chloroplast DNA. Okay? 
So the term homoplasmy is just the presence of only one version of DNA within the cytoplasm of a single cell. Replicative segregation is the random segregation of organelles into progeny in cell division. If two or more versions of an organelle are present in the parent, chance determines the proportion of each type that will segregate into each progeny cell. And in heteroplasmy is the presence of two or more distinct variants of DNA in the cytoplasm of a single cell. Individual cells can contain from dozens to hundreds of mitochondria and chloroplasts, each with numerous copies of organelle genome. So each plant typically possesses from hundreds to thousands of copies of mitochondrial and chloroplast DNA. A mutation coming within one DNA molecule within one organelle generates a mix of organelles in the cell, some with a mutant DNA sequence and others with a wild-type sequence. The occurrence of two distinct varieties of DNA in the cytoplasm of a single cell is called heteroplasmy. Okay? And you can see examples of that pictured here. Okay? When a heteroplasmic cell divides, the organelles segregate randomly into the two progeny in a process that's known as replicative segregation. Chance determines the proportion of the mutant organelles in each cell. Although most progeny cells inherit a mix of mutant and wild type organelles, some cells, by chance, may receive organelles with only mutant or only wild type sequence. The result in which all organisms are genetically identical is known as homoplasmy. Fusion of mitochondria also takes place frequently as well. Okay? So you can see examples of heteroplasmic and homoplasmic cells. This would be called a stochastic process. Okay? one that basically has randomness to it. Okay. A lot of traits affected by organelle DNA have been studied. One of the first to be examined in detail was the phenotype produced by petite mutations. In the late 40s, uh, a researcher named Efruzzi and his lab noticed that when they grew yeast on solid media, some colonies were much smaller than normal. Examination of these small colonies revealed that the growth rates of these cells within these colonies were reduced. The results of biochemical study demonstrated that the petite mutants were unable to carry out aerobic respiration and they obtained all their energy from anaerobic metabolism which is less efficient than aerobic and results in smaller copy sizes. Some petite mutations are defects in nuclear DNA but most occur in mitochondrial. Mitochondrial petite mutants often have large deletions in mitochondrial DNA, or in some cases are missing the mitochondrial DNA completely. Much of the mitochondrial sequence has enzymes encoded in it that catalyze aerobic respiration, so Krebs cycle enzymes. Therefore, petite mutants are unable to carry out aerobic respiration and can't produce normal quantities of ATP, and that inhibits their growth. Another known mitochondrial mutation occurs in Neurospora, um, Mitchell, in 52, um, was able to describe pokey mutants that grew slowly and displayed cytoplasmic inheritance and have abnormal amounts of cytochrome. Cytochromes are the protein components of the electron transport chain of the mitochondria and are critical to ATP production. Most organisms have three primary cytochromes, A, B, and C, while the pokey mutants have C, but no cytochrome A or B. Like the petite mutants, the pokey mutants are defective in ATP synthesis and grow more slowly. In recent years, a number of genetic diseases that result from mutations in mitochondrial DNA have been identified in humans. Lieber hereditary optic neuropathy results in, from mutations in the mitochondrial genes that encode electron transport protein. This condition typically leads to sudden loss of vision in middle age. Another disease caused by mitochondrial mutation is neurogenic muscle weakness, or ataxia, and retinitis pigmentosa, which is characterized by seizures, dementia, and developmental delay. Other mitochondrial diseases include kearns serre syndrome and chronic external ophthalmalgia, both of which result in paralysis of eye muscles, droopy eyelids, and in severe cases, loss of vision, deafness, and dementia. All diseases exhibit cytoplasmic inheritance and variable expression, right? So it's these organelles that are responsible. A trait in plants produced by mutations in mitochondrial genes is cytoplasmic natal sterility, a mutant phenotype found in 140 different plant species and inherited 
only from the maternal parent. These mutants inhibit pollen development but don't affect female fertility. A lot of chloroplast DNA mutants have also been discovered. One of the first was a mutation responsible for leaf variegation in four clocks which was studied by Corins back in 2009. In green algae, Chlamydomonas, streptomycin-resistant mutations occur in chloroplast DNA, and in higher plants, a lot of mutants exhibiting altered pigmentation have been traced to defects in chloroplast DNA as well. In most animals and fungi, the entire mitochondrial genome is a single double-stranded, highly coiled circular DNA molecule although there may be copies of the genome in each cell. The circular mitochondrial DNA molecule is similar in structure to bacterial chromosomes. Plant mitochondrial genomes exist as a complex collection of multiple circular DNAs. In some species, the mitochondrial genome consists of a single linear DNA molecule, so that's a little unusual. Each mitochondria has multiple copies of the mitochondrial genome, and a cell may contain many mitochondria. A typical rat liver cell, as an example, has from 5 to 10 mitochondrial DNA molecules in each of about 1,000 mitochondria, so each has between 5 to 10,000 copies of this genome. Mitochondrial DNA is about 1% of the total cellular DNA in a rat liver cell. Like bacterial chromosomes, mitochondrial DNA doesn't have histone proteins associated with eukaryotic nuclear DNA, Although it is complex with other proteins that have histone properties, the guanine cytosine content of mitochondrial DNA is sufficiently different from nuclear DNA that mitochondrial DNA can be separated from nuclear by density gradient centrifugation, like the cesium chloride um, protocol that I talked about a little bit earlier. Okay. Mitochondrial genomes are tiny compared with nuclear genomes and vary greatly in size among different organisms as shown here. The sizes of the mitochondrial genomes for most species range from 15 to 65,000 base pairs, but a few species are smaller. As an example, Plasmodium, which is a parasite that causes malaria, is only 6,000 base pairs. Those of some plants are several million. There is no correlation, however, between genome size and the number of genes. The number of genes is more constant than the genome size. Most species have only 40 to 50 genes, which encode five basic functions. Respiration, oxidative phosphorylation, translation, transcription, RNA processing, and the import of proteins into the cell. Most of the variation in the size of mitochondrial genomes is due to differences in non-coding DNA sequences. As we talked about, earlier, genes for most proteins and enzymes found in mitochondria actually come from nuclear DNA. Okay. What you're looking at here is the human mitochondrial genome. It's a 16.5 KB, okay, very economical in its organization. Uh, shown in panel A, right, the outer circle represents the heavy strand and the inner circle represents the light strand. The origins of replication for the heavy and the light strands are on the Ori H or the Ori L uh, region, respectively. Okay, ND identifies genes that encode subunits of NADH dehydrogenase, which is an enzyme that's used in the Krebs cycle. Electron micrographs of isolated mitochondrial DNA are shown on the right. Okay, so again, more evidence that this is derived from bacteria, right? Yeast organization, right? Saccharomyces cerevisiae, this is the yeast that's used to make beer and bread, has mitochondrial DNA different from human mitochondrial. Although yeast mitochondrial genome is 78 KB, it's nearly five times as large. Uh, it encodes only six additional genes for a total of two ribosomal RNAs, 25 transfer RNAs, and 16 proteins. Most of the extra DNA in yeast mitochondria comes from non-coding sequences found within and between the genes. Flowering plants have the largest and most complex mitochondrial genomes. Their mitochondrial genomes range in size from 186 KB uh, in white mustard to um, 240 KB in muskmelon. Even closely related plant species may differ 
than the sizes of their mitochondrial DNA. Part of this variation in the size of the mitochondrial DNA in the angiosperms is explained by the presence of long sequences of direct repeats. Crossing over between these repeats can generate multiple circular chromosomes of different sizes. The mitochondrial genome in turnips consists of a master circle of 218 KB that has direct repeats. Homologous recombination between the repeats can generate two smaller circles of 135 KB and 83 KB. Okay. KB means kilobases. Right? Other species have several direct repeats and provide possibilities for complex crossing over events that can increase or decrease the number and the sizes of the circles. As we already talked about, comparisons of mitochondrial sequence with DNA sequence from bacteria support a common bacterial origin for all mitochondrial DNA. However, patterns of evolution seen in mitochondrial DNA vary among different groups of organisms. The sequence of vertebrate mitochondrial DNA exhibits an accelerated rate of evolution. The sequences in mammalian, for example, typically change from five to ten times faster than in mammalian nuclear DNA. The acceleration rate of evolution in vertebrate mitochondrial DNA is due to a high mutation rate, and this allows sequences to change more quickly. In spite of the high rate of sequence evolution, the number of genes present in the organization of the vertebrate mitochondrial genome is constant. In contrast, sequences of plant mitochondrial DNA evolve slowly at a rate of only one-tenth that of the nuclear genome, but their gene content and organization changes rapidly. The reason for these differences in evolution isn't yet fully understood. Mitochondrial DNA has been studied extensively to reconstruct patterns of evolution in human and other organisms. Some of the advantage of using mitochondrial DNA for evolutionary studies include the fact that, number one, the small size of the mitochondrial DNA makes it easy um, to basically isolate and sample. Two, the rapid evolution of mitochondrial DNA in some organisms facilitate study of closely related groups, and three, the maternal inheritance of mitochondrial DNA and the lack of recombination makes it possible to trace female lines of, of descent. Samples of human mitochondrial DNA from thousands of people belonging to hundreds of different ethnic groups throughout the world have been analyzed, and these samples are helping unravel aspects of human evolution. As an example, initial studies of mitochondrial sequence led to the proposal that small groups of humans migrated out of Africa 85,000 years ago and populated the rest of the world. This is called the Out of Africa Hypothesis or the African Replacement Hypothesis and has gained wide acceptance. The Out of Africa Hypothesis is supported by additional study of DNA sequence of the Y chromosome as well as nuclear genes. The use of mitochondrial DNA in evolutionary studies will be dealt with a little bit later. At conception, a mammalian zygote inherits about 100,000 copies of mitochondrial DNA from the egg. Because of the large number of mitochondrial molecules in each cell and the high rate of mutation of this DNA, most cells would be expected to contain a mix of wild and mutant mitochondrial DNA or be heteroplasmic. However, this condition is rarely present. The copies of mitochondrial DNA in most individuals are genetically identical, so they're homoplasmic. And to account for this, um, geneticists hypothesize that at some point in early development or gamete formation, mitochondrial DNA goes through some type of bottleneck during which the mitochondrial DNA within a cell is reduced to just a few copies, which then replicate and give rise to all the other copies of mitochondrial DNA. As a result, genetic variation in mitochondrial DNA within a cell is eliminated. Recent studies have provided evidence that a bottleneck does exist but there is contradictory evidence concerning where it happens. The symptoms of a lot of human genetic diseases can be caused by mitochondrial DNA defects, and these can uh, appear initially in middle age or later and increase in severity the older we get. One hypothesis is um, related to the decline in oxidative phosphorylation as we age. This is the process that generates most of our ATP, um, this takes place in the inner membrane of the mitochondria and requires a number of different proteins, some encoded by mitochondrial DNA and others by nuclear genes. This process, the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation, declines as we get older, and if it falls below a critical threshold, tissues don't make enough ATP 
to sustain vital function and disease happens. Most people start life with an excess capacity for oxidative phosphorylation which decreases as they get older but most people reach old age or die before the critical threshold is passed. People who are born with mitochondrial disease carry mutations in their mitochondrial DNA and this lowers their ability for oxidative phosphorylation. At birth their capacity may be sufficient to support ATP needs but as oxidative phosphorylation capacity declines with age they cross a critical threshold and begin to experience disease. Why does this capacity decline? One explanation is that damage to mitochondrial DNA accumulates. Deletions and base substitutions cause damage to that information. As an example, a 5 kb deletion in mitochondrial DNA is absent in the heart muscle cells before the age of 40, but afterward the deletion is present with increasing frequency. The same deletion is found at low frequency in normal brain tissue before 75, but 12% or more uh, in the basal ganglia by 80. People with mitochondrial genetic disease can age prematurely because they begin life with damaged mitochondrial DNA, and so the process is sped up. The mechanism of age-related increases in mitochondrial DNA damage isn't yet known. Oxygen radicals, which are basically electron poor species that run around inside cells and steal electrons from healthy molecules and destroy them may be responsible. Um, these are known to damage DNA. Because mitochondrial DNA is physically close to the enzymes taking part in oxidative phosphorylation, there may be more, they may be more prone to oxidative damage than nuclear DNA. When mitochondrial DNA has been damaged, the cell's capacity to make ATP is going to decline. In plants, chloroplast genome ranges in the size from 80 kb to 600 kb, but most chloroplast genomes range from 120 kb to 160 kb. Chloroplast DNA is usually a single double-stranded DNA molecule that's circular, highly coiled, and lacks the associated histone proteins. Just like in mitochondrial DNA, multiple copies of chloroplast genome are found in each organelle and there are multiple organelles per cell, so there are several hundred to thousand copies of chloroplast DNA in a typical plant cell. The chloroplast genomes of a number of plant and algal species have been sequenced, and this DNA is now recognized to be basically bacterial in organization. The order of some groups of genes is the same as observed in E. coli, and a lot of chloroplast genes are organized into clusters similar to those found in bacteria. Many of the gene sequences in the chloroplast DNA are similar to those found in homologous bacterial genes. And you can see here some examples of the organism and the size of the chloroplast DNA. Okay. In vascular plants, chloroplast genomes are similar in gene content and gene order. A typical chloroplast genome encodes four ribosomal RNA genes from 30 to 35 transfer RNA genes and a lot of ribosomal protein which are proteins engaged in photosynthesis, and several proteins that are non-photosynthetic. An important protein encoded by chloroplast DNA is Rubisco, that stands for ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase, but I like to say Rubisco, kind of sounds like Nabisco, okay? And this participates in the fixation of carbon in photosynthesis. It's an important enzyme. Rubisco makes up about 50% of the protein found in green plants and is therefore considered the most abundant protein on Earth. It's a complex protein consisting of eight identical large subunits and eight identical small subunits. The large subunit is encoded by chloroplast DNA, where the small subunit is encoded by nuclear DNA. A lot of chloroplast DNA consists of non-coding sequence as well. As we've seen, a lot of proteins found in modern mitochondria and chloroplasts are encoded by nuclear genes and this suggests that much of the genetic material in the original endosymbionts has been transferred over evolutionary time to the nucleus. This can be supported by the observation that DNA sequences normally found in mitochondrial DNA have been detected in nuclear DNA in strains of yeast and corn. In addition, chloroplast sequences have been found in the nuclear DNA of spinach. Also, the sequences of the nuclear genes that encode organelle proteins are most similar to their bacterial counterparts. There's no evidence that during evolution, genetic materials move from the chloroplast to the mitochondria. 
For example, DNA fragments from some ribosomal RNA genes that are normally found in chloroplast DNA have been found in the mitochondrial DNA of corn. Sequences from the gene that encodes the large subunit of rubisco, which is normally encoded by chloroplast DNA, are duplicated in corn mitochondrial DNA, and there is even evidence that some nuclear genes have moved into the mitochondrial genome. The exchange of genetic material between nuclear mitochondrial and chloroplast genomes over evolutionary time has given rise to the term promiscuous DNA to describe the phenomenon. The mechanism that happens, that causes to happen, isn't yet determined, but it may be something like a transposon, right? Where there's a, an enzyme transposase that can clip out a piece of DNA and then it can integrate into a repeating sequence in another location, just like the jumping genes that are in corn, okay? Some plants acquired mitochondrial DNA from other plants through a process known as horizontal gene transfer. One plant called Amborella, which is a large shrub found in New Caledonia, has an enormous mitochondrial genome of 4,000 KB of DNA, approximately. Its mitochondria contain the equivalent of six foreign mitochondrial genomes acquired from green algae, moss, and other flowering plants. Researchers proposed that this plant captured mitochondrial DNA from other plants when it was covered by other plants and subsequently wounded, and this led to the transfer of foreign mitochondria and the fusion of mitochondria within the cell of this plant. Okay, So it's sort of a, a long-term example of transformation, okay, which we can do in the lab by throwing DNA at an organism and causing the membrane to take it up and express it. Okay. All right, I thank you for listening, and I will join you in the next podcast.